Um, it's my privilege just to be able to introduce the three speakers uh, today. Can you hear me okay? The microphone? Yep, good. Um, uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Wanda Pillow from the University of Utah. Uh, Wanda is an associate professor jointly appointed in gender studies in the Department of Education, Culture and Society, where she offers courses in qualitative research methods, gender, race and sexuality studies, race feminism and post-structural theories, and education policy. She's the author of Unfit Subjects, Education Policy and the Teen Mother, co-editor of Working the Ruins, Feminist Post-Structural Theory and Methods in Education, and is published in several education and feminist gender studies journals. Her work focuses on intersectional analyses of the relationship between subjectivity and representation, and on tracing what this means and looks like methodologically and theoretically across cultural productions, policy, and embodied praxis. Professor Pillow is committed to mentoring students and emerging scholars in post-structural methods and participates in several national professional organisations. Wanda will give the, the, first, the first lecture here and the way that we've organised it is that then uh, Dr Sam Seller and Dr Eva Bendix-Peterson will provide uh, both a further working of the ruins in, in, in response to an extension of Wanda's talk. So Dr Sam Seller from the University of Queensland is a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Education. He is previously a postdoctoral research fellow in the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education. Sam is currently working on three Australian Research Council projects investing, investigating national and global education policy, new accountabilities in schooling and the aspirations of young people in high poverty regions. Sam has recently published articles in the Journal of Education Policy British Educational Research Journal, Comparative Education and Educational Philosophy and Theory. He has a forthcoming book with Bob Lingard, Goli Reze Rashti and Wayne Martino titled Globalising Educational Accountabilities, Testing Regimes and Rescaling Governance. And finally, Dr Eva Bendix-Peterson from the University of Newcastle in Australia is a senior lecturer at the School of Education. Before joining Newcastle in 2009, she held academic positions at other Australian and Danish universities. By bringing, by bringing together Foucauldian discourse analysis, policy sociology, actor network theory, post-structural feminist theory and institutional ethnography, she has brought new perspectives on academic culture, work and subjectivities. Generally, she is interested in identity subject formation in education contexts, and she has recently published articles in studies in higher education, cultural studies, critical methodologies and learning and teaching. And her forthcoming book is titled Post-Structural Praxis, Living in the Education Machine, Coming Out with Sense. Um, it really is uh, a, a great pleasure for us to have these three uh, people give this talk at this time after what has been quite an exhausting day and a half of, of interrogation of ideas and without getting much of a break. And, and so Amy and I are, are very, very thankful and grateful for the three of you for, for putting this effort in to do this. The, the way uh, this will work is that uh, the three will talk and then there will be questions afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Wanda to the microphone. All right, I think I'm appropriately mic'd up now <laughs> and ready to go. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Wanda Sue Pillow, daughter of Willie Rogers Pillow and Bonna Jean Seal, Seal Pillow, born in Detroit, where my father, with three of his 12 brothers and sisters, migrated from their home in rural Arkansas, seeking factory jobs. I am sister to three women and soul sisters to many more, mother of three and other mother to many more. I began my introductions this way to remember and honor my parents and extended families and to point out that my journey to and through academia has been and remains one of dislocation and racialization, the joy of reading combined with sometimes painful struggle, as well as confusion sometimes at our academic ways. My family histories and experiences work their way into my theory and praxis. It was my father's storytelling, his relooping stories of trickster identity identities and power that gave me a different way of reading and understanding postmodern theory. I want to thank the workshop um, participants and panel organizers, organizers Dr. Amy Metcalf and Dr. Cal Gol um, Golson, as well as 
our key components here who keep everything running, for this opportunity to continue this journey today and to share some ideas I've been thinking through. I also appreciate Dr. Eva Peterson and Dr. Sam Seller for joining me on this panel and taking time to formulate um, responses that I expect will engage with and extend the ideas we've been discussing the past two days. And I look forward to our conversation then later this afternoon. Um, so let's begin. July of 2013, I was in New York City to give a talk titled Young Parents as Students at a Pregnant and Parenting Convening Conference when an unsettling recognition hit me. The unsettling didn't come from my location. New York City feels almost like a second home to me. I've been working there for over 10 to 12 years with community agencies concerned with outcomes for young parents, now commonly in the U.S. referred to as PPY, pregnant and parenting youth. This work has taken me across every borough in New York City as I've worked alongside my co-partner in these efforts, a self-described black womanist lawyer and nonprofit founder who is now the deputy Commissioner of Family Permanency Services for in the Administration for Children's Services in New York City. The convening audience included 300 youth social welfare and foster care case managers, administrators and staff, youth juvenile justice workers, lawyers, community organizers, pastors and ministers, adult mentors, young parents, commissioners, deputy commissioners, and elected officials. It was the summer before a mayoral election, local media were in attendance, and just before I was scheduled to begin my talk, a suited man approached me and said, Wanda, the mayor's office would like a copy of your speech in PowerPoint by the end of the day. I recall numbly nodding while inside I was shocked by a realization, you are not in academia anymore. Today I want to take the opportunity to focus on and think through my journey to that July day asking what happens when the feminist post-structuralist theorist sits at the policy table. This discussion will take us on a journey through bodies, feminist genealogy, and darkened epistemologies, the ruins of theories and systems, Title IX and gender equity law, and a look at youth navigating system ruins and return to consideration of what policy and policy work looks like amidst the ruins. Specifically, I have two primary goals. First, to share the context of the work I'm doing in New York City, and second, reflect upon what is the role of theory and theoretical responsibilities in this work. In asking the question, what happens when the feminist post-structural theorist sits at the policy table, I'm interested particularly in the question of what is the role of theory. As Stephen Ball noted in 1995, quote, the point about theory is not that it is simply critical. In order to go beyond the accidents and contingencies which enfold us, it is necessary to start from another position and begin from what is normally excluded. Theory provides this possibility, end quote. I am interested in how, through this possibility, theory offers another language, and how the femme post-structuralist at the policy table can take up the role, as Ball states, of theorist as a cultural critic, and I would add theorist as being translated and translator. Today I will also encourage us to think about the role of theory in terms of the importance of asking questions about which theories we utilize and think from, a practice I have recently been calling and darkened theoretical responsibility. For several years, my interests have focused on the relations between discourse, knowledge, power, and representations, and particularly how constructs and ideologies of gender, race, and sexuality impact what we think we know, how we come to know it, and where this knowledge goes in policy and practice. Most recently, my involvement in this area has focused on attempts to reframe teen pregnancy as an educational equity issue. Coming into academia so naively like I did 15 years ago, I wrote what I felt and what I was passionate about. My texts and publications take up theoretical and methodological questions that have often situated me as an outsider even in the academy, and like any genealogically influenced projects, offer tracings more than answers. So how then did I end up at the policy table of the largest educational and youth social welfare systems in the United States? How does work describe is decentered, idiosyncratic, and unintelligible, as my work was labeled in 1998, um, and which calls for working the ruins, end up at policy discussions in New York City. Certainly I was at the table because of the access and energy of my co-collaborator. 
although we worked for over 10 years without any major funding, we kept festering the edges of policy implementation and practice in New York City and developed relations across many agencies. Yet in July after the convening, sitting at a policy table with stakeholders, I realized it was not just entree or my doggedness on this issue for over a decade that got me a seat at the table. I was at the table alongside epidemiologists and large-scale quantitative policy analysts because systems are failing and are in ruins. In education in the U.S., this means that our graduation rates are systemically low. Overall, below 70 percent for American Indian, African American, and Latina Latina students. And in some areas, graduation rates for these populations are far lower, below 49 percent. In New York City, low graduation rates demonstrate a city segregated by school, location, and race. In 2012, New York City had an overall graduation rate of 60 percent. 60 percent. So how many youth are not graduating? Help me out here. <laughs> How many? 40%. 40% of the youth in New York City in 2012 were not graduating from high school overall. The numbers are even more disturbing when analyzed by race. In 2012, graduation rates for black males in New York City were on average 42%. Black females fared a bit better, hovering at around 50%. Further in New York City, only 21.9% of all students who graduate with a high school degree tested college and career ready. New York City has another level of testing they do when you're a high school graduate. And by their accounts, only 21.9% of all youth overall tested as college or career ready. So let's be generous and take the 21% of the black males graduating. That means even under best case scenarios, only 9% of these youth are declared to be ready for college and or a career. New York City's own data reveals that our systems are failing. This case, 91% of African American and black males, and likewise close to 90% of African American and black females, are not graduating from high school or not graduating college or career ready. This failure of education in New York City limited my involvement in working with the school districts there. From, 2011 to 2000, from 2001 to 2011, education personnel would only meet with me with a lawyer present in the room. So worried were they about a lawsuit. We'll, I'll talk more about this later. Another data point, as of November 2013, there were 11,789 youth in foster care in New York City. Over 150 of these youth are in foster care separate group home residences for pregnant and mothering girls. 99% of the youth in these homes are African American and 1% are Latina. So keep these numbers in mind for later we'll return to them. So I'm suggesting that the femme post-structuralist theorist researcher who thinks through ruins of structures and systems, identities, humanisms, racisms, sexism, sexualizations, feminisms, and colonialisms is useful and perhaps even necessary because many of our systems are in ruins. If post-structuralists are the downers theoretically in the academy and the policy arena I was simply relating the ruins. Commissioners and deputy commissioners of education and social welfare know this. Caseworkers and teachers know this. And while of course they want answers, more than anything else I found in my recent experience, they want ideas. Ideas that can address systemic malfunction across layers of bureaucracies and policies. As the Administration for Children's Services Commissioner stated in October 2013, we have to be critical thinkers. We have to think differently to face existing problems and have the outcomes with youth that we desire. I've argued one way to aid this type of deep critical thinking in the policy arena is feminist genealogy. Post-structurally informed and grounded in Foucault's reformulation of Nietzsche's genealogy, feminist genealogy traces and identifies an embodiment of policy. 
shifting the lens of analysis from the policy subject as the problem to a focus on tracing policy ideology and discourse. Feminist genealogy provides an intricate historical tracing of power through discourses, culture, and structures, and an embodied narrative of this tracing that not only identifies what is present in discursive policies and practices, but also what is absent. I have argued previously that feminist genealogy is one way to keep discomfort in play as an analytical practice, that is to work and think with the knowledge of the nimble mechanizations and technologies of power and recognize and think against a comfortable analysis. So with my fem post embodied feminist genealogy tools, my current work with the Administration for Children's Services in New York City is taking me into the arena of foster care, specifically young women in foster care group homes who are pregnant and or mothering. These young women are considered to be deeply impacted subjects, negatively influenced by poverty, homelessness, and hunger, combined with exposure to inhumane treatment, including forms of violence and sexual assault, health problems due to neglect, broken family ties, and usually lack of any strong ties to any other adult or community. The young women are protected themselves under the child welfare foster care systems while simultaneously under surveillance of their own mothering capacities by the very same agency. Based upon social work intake policies and the young women's needs, safety, housing, sustenance, and health care are prioritized, and ACS, like many welfare agencies, works under a well-being model of care for its clients. The challenge I have been charged with is how to include and tighten the link between education and well-being for these youth. With my feminist genealogy lens, I'm looking across and deeply into all places that, pra that policy occurs, as discourse and text, as they're narrated, translated, performed, and transacted from administrator meetings at ACS to workshops to visits and participation in the foster care group homes, interacting with the staff and the young women. In this, I continue to find a deep connection between the historical social constructions of teen pregnancy and the teen mothers and present-day policy outcomes and enactments. We know that perceptions about in images about the unwed mother and the teen mother and the welfare queen impact policy framework from problem definition to evaluation. Shame, stigma, and fear campaigns create a limited policy environment, setting the stage for what Linda Singer in her wonderful book, Erotic Welfare, calls epidemic logic. Singer argues that under the specter of epidemic, quote, forms of regulatory intervention are accepted when in other circumstances such interventions would appear excessive. Epidemic logic, which runs on a binary of empathy to fear, justifies extraordinary regulatory practices and limits discussions of many other options. Because of the discursive need to respond to a crisis and contain it and its cost on society, epidemic logic also creates the face of the crisis for us, the face of the problem, and links this face either with pity, the epidemic is beyond this person's control, or in the case of teen pregnancy, links the racialized face with lack of morals, laziness, deficit families, or culture. Lest we think that shame and erotic camp welfare campaigns are a thing of the past, consider New York City's summer 2013 media campaign sponsored by the mayor's office. Large ads portraying racialized babies in various states of distress appeal to their teen mothers and parents. Honestly, mom, chances are he won't stay with you. What about me? And got a good job? I cost thousands of dollars each year. These ads are created clearly created an image for everyone of who the problem is, youth of color in New York City who are behaving immorally and irresponsibly and reproducing, and who the burden falls on, innocent babies and society. Placement of the ads in all boroughs of New York City not only targeted the youth assumed of being the problem, the face of teen pregnancy, but at the same, same time created a memorable an effective message about how everyone else should think about and view youth of color and young parents. 
From this context, the layperson would be hard pressed to recall that just a year before in 2012, the U.S. celebrated the 40th anniversary of Title IX, a legislative enactment considered to be one of the most progressive sex equity statutes in North America. Title IX passed in 1972 covers six areas of gender equality, athletics, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, career and technical education, sexual harassment, single sex education, and the rights of pregnant and parenting students. To date, the focus, 40 years later, particularly in media and public mind, has been on athletics, young girls and women's access to sport from K-12 to college level. This arena has seen the most case law and policy initiatives driving and changing practice. Here, we're going to focus on the most underlooked component of Title IX, the right of pregnant and parenting students. While Title IX explicitly addresses educational policy and practice for equal treatment of pregnant and parenting students, to date we have no case law in the U.S. to guide district and school level policy and practice, and this means we have a disparate system of educational access for pregnant and parenting students, dependent upon then local culture, beliefs, and status quo practices. Researchers, including myself, have identified what this means and results in. We have a lack of data, meaning we do not even know where pregnant and parenting students are going to school, what their attendance rates are, what their graduation rates are. A lack of knowledge. Educators, including district office, Title IX coordinators, most often do not even know that Title IX has specific provisions for pregnant and parenting youth. This all impacts the lack of regulation. These conditions make it difficult to evaluate and regulate pregnant and parenting students' experiences in school. A handful of qualitative research studies and anecdotal accounts indicate that these youth, youth face many barriers in accessing and continuing education, but the lack of data collection continues to hinder regulation. We know that this results in uneven educational opportunities and access, continued push-out practices, and existence of multiple barriers. As Michelle Goh notes in a 2011 Michigan Journal of Gender and Law, pregnant and parenting youth have been left out of the discussion and therefore the understanding of the implementation of Title IX regulations. A National Women's Law Center 2012 publication, A Pregnancy Test for Schools, echoes this lack of attention to Title IX for pregnant and parenting students and decries the present dearth of data as detrimental to any movement on the issue. My experiences have shown that when a school district feels threatened with possible litigation under Title IX, as New York City School District did between 2002 and 2007, they can respond with systemic policy changes. In New York City's case, the district closed their separate schools for young mothers, the so-called P-schools. I'll let you unpack P-schools for yourself another time. Um, without putting any other plans or provisions for improving access to equal education opportunity for pregnant or parenting students in place. The lack of data overall allowed New York City School District to do this, to respond in this way, and it leaves concerned agencies, individuals, and researchers then scrambling to try to collect new data to challenge the now new policies and practices. In previous publications, I've argued that the silences and the lack of data and knowledge surrounding young parents and education is a purposeful silence. This isn't simply a gap in knowledge or an oversight, but an active form of epistemic ignorance with its roots in what Charles Mills describes as epistemological racism. If, as Charles Mills asserts, whiteness is both a political construct and a paradigm of knowing that involves an agreement, a contract, to not know certain things, to misinterpret others, and to count these as true, then ignorance is not an accident. Title IX then becomes what David Gilborn in 2006 describes as policy as placebo, text that purportedly looks like it is addressing an equity equality issue, but in effect serves only as a placeholder. Policy as placebo cannot occur, I argue, without epistemological isms of gender and race. In the spaces I've been observing and participating in, power and oppressions are invisible and visible, and slippery and savvy and nimble. 
They are, as Mills describes, a form of unwritten, unacknowledged contracts that nonetheless are hegemonically ingrained in discursive policy practices and behavior. In response, I need theoretical tools like feminist genealogies that are equally agile. However, I believe that a fem-post approach that does not make Mills's racial contract theory central can remain too enlightened. In other words, if genealogical tracings occur in a vacuum of whiteness, then it is missing the critical edges it needs and seeks. Here I don't simply mean whiteness as a racial category, but whiteness as an epistemological blanket, a whiteout effect. While I believe I have always thought and lived from and through intersectional feminisms, meaning my feminisms is always already a woman of color informed feminisms, the youth in foster care and the case workers I am thinking with now are requiring me to dig deeper and think with more awareness and complexities. In December, I experienced an act of physical, emotional, and soul-shaking violence, the effects of which I am still reliving even while I attempt to recover and to heal. This experience of my own life splintering, fragmenting, fractured, and the utter instability of recovering has temporarily given me personal experience with what the young mothers in foster care describe as, quote, living with constant chaos in your body and in your mind while others are watching everything you do, end quote. Out of lived experiences of pain combined with surveilled discourses of recovery and fixing what ails us, I have turned and returned to a term in Darkened that Cynthia Dillard first presented in the Journal of Qualitative Studies and Education in 2000. I read and utilize in Darkened alongside Handel Wright's questions of how social cultural difference may operate within an darkened feminist epistemology and how the concept, discourse, and project would work in relation to existing, presumably, allied discourses. Handel reads in Darkened with a postmodernism that is interlaced with, he says, a black ambivalence about the posties. As a postie whose entree to postmodernism was through my father and Jacana feminisms, I have had an equally ambivalent relationship with post theories, which compels me to suggest that an endarkened genealogy is necessary to keep a nimble and critical eye on how colonial whiteout power is slippery and shifting in analyses of gender, race, and sexuality. An endarkened approach to feminist genealogy provides another lens to read the cracks of discursive regulation and reproduction of certain bodies. And while I am invested in the meeting points and trajectories of endarkened feminism's policy and genealogy, I have come to feel that if endarkened feminism is not forefronted deeply in these connections, then its impact could be lost, blanketed, whitened out. In thinking through this in my writing and pedagogy, I have wondered, am I bordering on a prescription to fix the potential enlightenment of feminist genealogy? Out of a call to take race theories and darkened epistemology seriously in all femme post work, would I, for example, require that my students engage with and cite a list of darkened feminisms and theories? While this may be necessary, we know this would not be enough. I think what I want from myself and from other feminist post-structural scholars through an encounter with Darkened is similar to what I wrote in a 2002 article, When a Man Does Feminism, Should He Dress in Drag? In this article, I stated that what I want is not a man in or and with feminism, but a man after feminism. The after marks an ongoing change and challenge that we experience through encounter, personally, methodologically, and theoretically. Or as Deborah Britzman implores us, stop reading straight and do the hard work to see the drag of what we think or name as normal and then investigate this normalcy with all of the theoretical intensity the social sciences has gone after the abnormal. It is what we see, what we are open to, what assumptions we set aside, what we can respond to after we undress the drag of normal, after we encounter and experience in darkness that I am interested in. In a 2006 discussion of critical race theory, David Gilborn named two needs for the educational policy arena.
The second being the need to strengthen the critical character of scholarship that addresses racialized inequalities in practice. I am moved and intrigued by Gilborn's wording choice of critical character. What is our responsibility as researchers, scholars, educationalists, and educators to pay attention to the character of our theories? Let's return to my work with ACS and to the young woman who is in foster care and while in care becomes pregnant. She has layers of systems to interact with in order to get her basic needs met. Child welfare for herself and her child, family permanency, health care, well baby checks for her children, sex education for herself, education for herself and for her child, job training for herself, legal aid, juvenile court, to name a few of the agencies. She must know these systems inside and out in order to access care. The young mother must be multiply conscious and nimble in response to entrenched policies that at time have contradictory aims. You have likely been straining to read the slide. This was purposeful. A young mother in foster care drew this for me. She created this image to help me understand understand what it's like to navigate these systems of care that she's in. And this copy is intentionally blurry, fuzzy, and difficult to read and, and, to, and to determine what is important. This is what navigating the systems of recovery feel like to the young mother. And I would add, I've also heard this from the caseworkers who are attempting to help youth navigate these systems of care. To me, these young women think otherwise continually. They are always thinking about power and systems that proliferate their problems and fragment their identities while at designated or sometimes unknown moments in time require her to be stagnant, frozen in a point of time, and be an in-place subject so that she can be properly documented on her road to recovery. To date, qualitative research characterizes this resourcefulness on the part of youth or caseworker as voice or as forms of resiliency or resistance. From rights of redemption to discourses of desire to current discussions of the dandelion versus orchid personality, much of this focus has remained upon the bodies and voices of youth and caseworkers speaking back to and navigating blurry systems. While this work is necessary and useful, I have found a turn to and darkened necessary to access and trace a different kind of depth of structural and epistemological racisms and violences embedded in our agencies, policies, and practices. The endarkened isn't to clear up the image, but to implode and proliferate it. There are those of us, as Audre Lloyd poignantly reminds us, who were never meant to survive. My current work has me thinking that others and myself have only partially and perhaps selectively heard and analyzed experiences when done through a femme post lens. With an endarkened lens, I'm suggesting we have the opportunity to hear something else. That something else I am thinking of as an endarkened survival or utilizing Chippewa scholar, theorist, and writer Gerald Visner's notion of survivance, what I would call an endarkened survivance. Survivance, as Visner describes, is a native motion and an active presence that works to interrupt colonialist trappings of absence, tragedy, and powerlessness. When youth and caseworker staff navigate systems that fragment youth but also require them at key points to be fixed subjects, when youth and caseworkers show up every day and participate and talk with a sense of the future despite systems that are in ruins that systematically are fa failing and ruining accessibility and outcomes for youth of color, I don't think this is simply individual resiliency. My current work is asking me to see the ability to navigate the ruins of systems as a form of survival and darkened survivance. In October, I talked with a young, uh, young African-American man, age 20, who has three children under the age of six. He articulates a critical and darkened genealogical view of society and economy but at the same time has to perform and act within these systems and find his way through them in order to have access to his children. He has to continually pass surveillance checks through which he is rated, judged, or evaluated on his competencies and capacities as a father and as a citizen, economically, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. 
I asked this young man what he would suggest for policy, and his responses are depicted on the slide. And I would say that this young father's statements echo what I've heard again and again from youth in care, and also from many caseworkers. The desire for policies that are more fluid and nimble, and for policies that make an investment in youth, not a placebo effect, but a tangible investment. Alongside our specifically articulated desires by young parents, male and female, Remove your barriers about who you think I am and hear me, witness me, and be persistent. I've been through a lot, I may need time. Please be persistent. Note that this persistence is not being required of the youth, which is how it is typically thought and programmed, but persistence being required of adults and of our systems. Youth in particular, then, I would suggest, speak through in darkened lenses. Their lives and worlds include daily encounters with colonial and racist systems, structures, and discourses. Their voices and actions move beyond individual resistance or resilience to a survivance, survival for themselves and their children, with an active knowledge of the constructs that contain and seek to debilitate them, even as they must access these constructs for support. So where do we go with this knowledge? Can I have a magic wand? One young mother asked me. Working with these youth, post-structural critiques are necessary, but I suggest not enough. The systems are in ruins, yet many youth are depending upon these systems and the adults in them for survivance. How can the femme post-structuralists reframe these ruins then, offer other options for proliferative spaces to think from and act out from? Looking for a way to speak a disruptive and darkened epistemology into existing structural discourses, I have turned to President Obama's recent educational initiative. Responding to entrenched low high school graduation rates in the US, President Obama has set a goal for having the highest college graduation rate in the world by 2020. This goal is aligned with a recent initiative by the Office for Civil Rights to decrease out-of-school disciplinary actions that have been shown to disproportionately target and negatively impact African American, Latino and Latina, and American Indian youth. In these initiatives, I suggest there are endarkened possibilities for policy and practice. Recall the New York City graduation rates. Today, most of my policy work I have depended upon the language of Title IX and worked with women's law centers to determine what data might be effective to establish case law in order to broadly impact educational access and equal opportunity for pregnant and parenting youth. I didn't know that when I started working with ACS, which really came about because I didn't have access to education anymore in New York City without a lawyer sitting at the table beside of me. So this going in the sort of back door to collect data through ACS to look at an educational issue has really um, helped me both think creatively and think outside of the box about how to do this and what this might look like. It's also really made me rethink Title IX and how useful it might be or not be towards the goal of educational equity and equality for pregnant and parenting youth. In Title IX, if we look at these graduation rates, and the language in Title IX says that pregnant and parenting youth have the right to have an education equal to their peers. In other words, equal to what we can now think of as a policy placebo, if that's what Title IX is operating is. What it will get us is access to an education that is equal to the ruins in education. When we do this and we sit with ACS, then our discussions fall apart when we reach this. How can we say we want policy that will yield results of 42% and 49% graduation rates that only replicate the ruins? We can't, right? This will not be enough. So again, when I was shut out from access to education and working with ACS, I began thinking about it, what it would look like for young parents in foster care, those considered to be the most impacted youth, to access educational opportunity at rates higher than their peers. So what if we set our policy goals and discussions beyond equal opportunity? What policies and practices between ACS, foster care, group homes, and educational systems could facilitate this goal? 
This is a shift from policy language and practices created solely under a surveillance and deficit model to a relational model that specifically includes educational access as a key component to youth well-being and outcomes. It includes messages, like on this slide, which depict racialized pregnant and parenting youth as educational subjects. This shift also, I believe, requires an endarkened survivance transference in thinking, not a static response, but an active presence that is ever shifting. Instead of seeing the multiple layers of agencies involved with foster care youth as big bad bureaucracies or technologies that we can continually deconstruct, and yes, we can do this, we can use our FEMPO skills to point out the many contrary stuck humanist discourses in these agencies and to one-up each other on performance of our resistance to resistance strategies or work to show our outsider status. But what if we also shift within darkened responsibilities to, in the case of the FEM post working with ACS, take advantage of the fact that with all of the surveillance comes with many hands, many fluid op opportunities. That is, it is exactly because pregnant and parenting foster care youth are under the charge of multiple agencies and adults that there is the possibility and opportunities to multiply and increase caring and relational supports for these youth. As the youth are stating for this to happen, first they must be seen and witnessed as subjects worthy of investing time and resources in. If the politics of belonging is the dirty work of boundary maintenance, then here I want to always ask, how does policy development, interpretation, implementation, and evaluation participate in this boundary maintenance? Part of my work with young parents has been to expand the boundaries of how they are seen, who they are assumed to be, and what they and their children may become specifically to expand the boundaries of policy maintenance to include the pregnant parenting youth as an educational subject and as an educational subject who is entitled to something beyond the ruins of equal education opportunity, a subject worthy of being invested in. In order to see young parents, particularly young parents in foster care, as subjects worthy of investment, we will need to utilize policy to develop different proliferative pathways of relationships, relational policies that shift the adult from being a witness of the youth as a data point to a relational witnessing and in darkened witnessing. I have found that there is some sympathetical relationship between the ruins of the femme post-structural thinker and the ruins of our systems. Acting and thinking after and with and darkened feminisms is not a way out of the ruins, but a way of tracing the ruins, picking out and picking up key discursive structures and patterns, and in darkening these, operating with darkened theoretical responsibilities in theory and praxis. Currently, I'm in the midst of developing a report for ACS with the goal of providing ideas for fluid reational policies. I can only write this informed by endarkened genealogies and feminist post-structuralism. However, I do this work with much doubt and many questions. Working and thinking from and amongst the ruins is not easy. It is often draining and confusing, and sometimes it hurts. And yet, amidst the confusion and doubt, there are lives in violent chaos, lives who understand fragmentation beyond anything anyone should ever have to experience or carry the burden of. And these youth are asking for peace of mind, soul, and body. So while I continue and enjoy my deconstructive countering work, I also for now sit at a policy table and look at ruins like this 2010 photo of a Detroit public school and with others rethink and re-envision what could be. This is not about replications of what was, but in darkened femme post embodied tracings of what can be for now what can be now, because there is a necessity to the now, and what we can imagine in the future. So I produce nimble and darkened policy reports and work amongst the ruins of social welfare and education while continuing to grapple with my emotions and theoretical spinnings. I continue to be troubled by questions of what does success look like amongst the ruins for the feminist post-structural scholar, researcher, and practitioner. 
Well, for me, that isn't so much the question as how long should or can the endarkened fem posti sit at the policy table? I'll leave these questions for us all to continue and think about and debate more later. Thank you. I'd just like to begin by thanking Wanda for her wonderful presentation uh, and also to add my thanks to Cal and to Amy and to everyone else involved in making this workshop possible and the public lecture this afternoon possible, so thank you. Um, to respond to Wanda, I want to join in her in reflecting on an, a recent occasion when I found myself sitting at a policy table, although a very different one where young people were thoroughly constituted as data points and to think about my role as a critical education policy researcher who is interested in problematics and concepts drawn from post-structural theory and philosophy. Through this reflection, I want to consider how researchers like myself might contribute to policy contexts where economic theories and analytical capacities to work with large quantitative data sets have the greatest legitimacy and influence and where concerns about crises of representation, philosophies of difference, or questions of subjectivity are seen as, at best, irrelevant. What are the possibilities for those of us interested in post-structuralism to make a contribution to what Bob Lingard has described as policy by numbers? My hunch is that any such possibilities depend on cultivating a particular kind of critical disposition, one animated by the ethical good faith that Helen Verren has argued is required for talking across ontological and epistemological differences. In the preliminary remarks that open his book, Schizoanalytic Cartographies, Felix Guattari comments on what he describes as the machinic addiction of contemporary subjectivity. Subjectivity that is now everywhere mediated by computer-based technologies. Rather presciently, given that he was writing more than 20 years ago, Guattari provides a succinct diagnosis of the effects of new data and media infrastructures on everyday life, and he issues us with a challenge regarding how we might respond. I would like to quote Guattari at length on this point, and this is the only long tract of text that I'll have, so I apologise for this, um, and to begin with his observation that we are seeing an apparent democratisation of the access to data, to knowledge, but associated with a segregative closing down of the means for their elaboration. A planetary stirring up of cultures that paradoxically is contemporaneous with the growth of particularisms and racisms. An immense extension of techno-scientific and aesthetic fields of investigation unfolding in a moral context of greyness and disenchantment. But rather than associating with the fashionable crusades against the misdeeds of modernism, rather than preaching the rehabilitation of ruined transcendental values, or giving in to the disillusioned delights of postmodernism, we can try to challenge the dilemma of contorted refusal or cynical acceptance of the situation. And this is the challenge that I would like to take up today. I'm interested in working the ruins of transcendental values that might provide us with a basis from which to judge and to criticise the work of economists, statisticians, psychometricians who employ scientific practices to collect and analyse educational data. And I would like to work in the ruins of critical dispositions that oscillate between the poles of contorted refusal or cynical acceptance. Bruno Latour has provocatively suggested that critique has now run out of steam. And while I'm very cautious about such a claim, I am interested in his provocation to perhaps open up practices of critique that might afford new ways of engaging with others. So to give you some context, my current research is focused on, a large, on large scale assessments in education and the usage of performance data for accountability and policy making purposes. Large-scale assessments constitute an increasingly important and globally articulated infrastructure for generating data about the cognitive performance, personality traits and social backgrounds of students, teachers, schools and citizens more generally. Since the 1990s, we've seen a rapid acceleration in the production of data and accountability infrastructures in education. And the OECD's Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, which I'll talk about today, is perhaps the most prominent international example these infrastructures are now expanding along at least three lines. 
they're increasing in scope to generate data on more and more aspects of education and the economy. They're expanding in scale by covering an increasing number of individuals, schools and systems. And they're increasing in breadth to support more and different kinds of data analysis and knowledge production. While largely commissioned by national governments, these data infrastructures have generally been developed by international organisations such as the OECD or the IEA in collaboration with research centres and private companies who are contracted to undertake test development, implementation and analysis. Recently, we've seen large multinational edu businesses such as Pearson redefining themselves as providing services based on the large scale capture and analysis of data relating to educational outcomes. Data infrastructure is now a very lucrative and very influential business in education globally. So I would like to reflect on how one might operate as a critical policy scholar in this context. And in considering this question, I will draw on the concept of political ecology, or what we might call policy ecology in the context of education policy analysis. The particular concept of political ecology in which I'm interested has a lineage that can be traced from Gregory Bateson's notion that there are ecologies of ideas, mental ecologies in which bad ideas proliferate like weeds, and through the work of Deleuze and Guattari to more recent writers such as Bruno Latour, Isabel Stengers, Brian Mazzumi, Stephen Mewkey and many others. The ecological perspective taken up by these authors is based on the idea that there is no position of exteriority from which to undertake critique. We cannot stand outside of a social order to provide a disengaged analysis of it as a system of domination. Rather, any analysis con contributes to the systems, social, mental, physical, in which we're situated. And it is perhaps better to approach this contribution in the spirit of adding something or making something happen, and to avoid the diminishing effects that these authors associate with critical postures of debunking, demystification, judgment, or disqualification. So in the remainder of my talk, I will concentrate on a recent occasion in which I was given to reflect on how I might engage with a powerful site of contemporary education policy making. My reflections animated by a reworked version of a question posed by Latour, who, suggest, who asks us, is it possible to tackle the question of education politics and policy with care and respect? Now this is a challenging question in the context of the pervasive economisation and commercialisation of education and the cynical usage of numbers derived from economic analyses as the basis for education policy making and the sale of education services. Can we engage with these polit policy contexts with care and respect? And why would we want to do this? Wouldn't we just be copying to a form of capitalist realism in which we've run out of imagined alternatives? Latour raises his question in the context of a broader argument that we cannot rest assured that critique is sufficient to dispense with practices that we would like to disappear. Instead, he argues, we must find ways to cohabit with these practices and to contribute to their unfolding differently. In pursuing the concept of policy ecology, my wager is that many established academic practices of critique can function as a reasonably well-integrated part of capitalism as usual, and that new habits of thought might be needed in order to imagine and engender alternatives, even if these alternatives don't appear very critical within the established coordinates of critical thought. Of course, my concerns here are situated in my own experiences of working with policymakers, and the experiences and positionality of others may call for other modes of critique. So the occasion that I want to reflect on is a presentation that I gave to staff from the Directorate for Education at the OECD in October last year. Over the past few years, I've been working with a colleague, Professor Bob Lingard, on a project examining developments in PISA and the OECD's other large-scale human capital assessments. For this project, we've conducted three rounds of research interviews at the OECD headquarters in Paris. Nice work, if you can get it. And we're invited to present on our findings so far. Now, this presentation was a strange and intimidating experience. Since beginning the study, I've become increasingly troubled by the un uncomplicated views of the OECD and its work that I encounter when talking with other academics or reading research articles discussing the role of the organisation. Often, the OECD is represented as a kind of coherent, monolithic entity, imposing an agenda of neoliberal reform upon nations. 
but of course it's an intergovernmental organisation and it responds to the direction and the review of member nations in the analyses and policy prescriptions that it prepares. Now this is often a messy and contested political process that is belied by the organisation's glossy published outputs. And when visiting the OECD, we've been struck by the feel of the space, which is not dissimilar to a university. Many staff hold PhDs from prestigious institutions and are engaging in demanding intellectual work. As with any large organisation, staff hold a spectrum of political views and we've become aware of internal political contestation about the current direction of the organisation's education work. In particular, some interviewees have expressed their deep concerns about the direction of this work and clearly hope that our research might generate awareness and debate about this outside of the organisation. So, sitting face to face with a group of OED staff members, I felt acutely aware of how easy it is to write critical polemics about neoliberal education policy that will be appreciated by a group of like-minded academics, something that I've certainly done in the past, However, when talking to a group of clearly intelligent and well-informed insiders, I felt the impotence of the affective disposition or dispositions that often make such critical postures feel so forceful. And contrary to the ruins of which, uh, sorry, and contrary to the ruins amidst which Wanda found herself invited to the policy table, this policy space is infused with a sense of confidence in the organisation's capacities to review the policies of nations, to develop new technologies for policy analysis, and to expand its capacities for collecting and analysing large data sets in order to generate insights into educational and social problems. Instead of a dearth of data, PISA is at the cent centre of a new policy context in which we risk being overwhelmed by data. At the end of our presentation, a staff member approached us and asked whether we would write a short executive summary style report expanding on our finding that the work of the directorate risks becoming unbalanced in favour of its human capital assessment work and at the expense of its careful policy reviews that draw on both quantitative and qualitative data. This staff member saw in us possible allies with whom she could strengthen her case for the importance of sustaining the latter line of work. After presenting to an audience that I had presumed to be ideological and methodological opponents, I was struck by this attempt to build some sort of alliance with us. This, alleged, this event led me to recall a paper by Savage and Burroughs, who argue that sociology faces a coming crisis as governments and other organisations rapidly develop their capacities to collect and analyse large amounts of social data. They describe a research conference where Savage presented on methods he used to conduct one of the most detailed social network analyses undertaken in the UK at the time. At this event, Savage also ended up meeting another participant from a telecommunications company research unit who explained that he was able to conduct social network analyses using the logs of every phone call made through his company's system over the past few years. In other words, he had access to a massive data exhaust of private information generated through the company's everyday operations. Savage and Burroughs argue that, faced with such developments, academic sociologists cannot be satisfied with the obvious critiques that could be levelled against the collection of such data and the types of analyses that it affords. For example, the criticism that these call logs don't provide any insight into the content of the interactions or the complex lives of the callers. Instead, Savage and Burroughs suggest that, and I quote, the repertoires of empirical sociology need to be rethought in an age of knowing capitalism. This call goes far beyond the now familiar demand for more methods training, but asks for greater reflection on how sociologists can best relate to the proliferation of social data gathered by others, which we currently largely ignore. We do not think it is a satisfactory critical response to shrug these issues off through invoking our sophistication in relation to social theory. <coughs> Savage and Burroughs push us to think about the role of sociology and social research more broadly within the context of what Nigel Thrift has called knowing capitalism. That is, a contemporary condition in which capital continually monitors and modulates its practices through pervasive datafication of our everyday activities. The use of mobile devices, credit cards, loyalty cards, social media, internet searches and so on and operationalises this data to capture attention to increasingly intensive processes of knowledge and service work and consumption. In this context, it is perhaps the capacity 
to express critical views that sustains a unique position for researchers located within the academy. But is it enough to be critical of these developments from the outside, as if we could be, as if one could shrug off the influence that such data work now exerts? But also, as if one could shrug off invitations to contribute to policy that is increasingly derived from such data work, or to shrug off the invitations to build alliances with those who are more closely involved in this work and its use for policy making and governance purposes. What might we be able to offer these potential allies? So this brings me to the conclusion of my comments, and I want to return to the notion of political ecology in, an, in order to draw out three points regarding how critical policy scholars with interests in post-structuralism might engage with the kinds of policy spaces that I've described here. First, I'm learning to be wary of making assumptions about who I'm talking to in situations like the one I've described. A political ecology approach encourages careful attention to and engagement with the complexity of the practices of others. And in the case of the OECD and PISA, this would mean doing the thinking necessary to conceptualise the different kinds of institutions, political philosophies, political agendas, scientific practices, education policies, policy technologies, measurement instruments and so on that are involved in the policy work of the organisation. I think the concepts of assemblage and dispositif drawn from Deleuze and Guattari and Foucault respectively seem to offer policy analysis useful tools in this regard, although I'm sure there are other concepts with which we can pursue analytical work that increases complexity and provides an antidote to simplistic characterizations or caricatures of the practices and politics of others. Second, a political ecology perspective encourages, to encourages us to take responsibility for the contributions that our practices make to other practices at work in different policy spaces. And here I want to single out the scientific practices involved in data-driven policy work. I worry about how the humanities and social sciences sometimes endorse certain areas of the hard sciences, complexity theories, neuroscience, climate science, and reject other areas, often on what appear to be ideological grounds. It is important to distinguish between, on the one hand, techno-rational practices that seek legitimacy through claims to science and zealous forms of scientism, and on the other hand, science as a genuine adventure of thought, regardless of how it fits with our own theoretical perspectives. As Isabel Stengers has shown, the latter is animated by its own passions, and to resist critiques that diminish these passions and practices is, in her view, and I quote, to resist the belief in the power of proofs to disqualify what they have no means to create. Instead of practicing disqualifications across old divides, discounting that which we are not invested in actively creating, policy ecology would involve finding new ways to think in the presence of the practices of others, scientific or otherwise. And finally, political ecology suggests a project of creating new compositions of forces. Stephen Mukey reminds us that politics is a matter of alliances, and he calls for a criticism without judgment, which would be a mode of criticism that is about, and I quote, establishing real relations and robust pragmatic connections across an array of different modes of existence. To be clear, this is not a matter of simply going with the flow but rather of recognising that to influence the unfolding of things, one cannot assume a position outside of their unfolding. Can we use philosophical concepts to engineer connections across different practices and different modes of existence? And if so, how? Can we imagine a mode of criticality in which the role of critical policy scholars would be to use concepts and to develop new problematizations as engineers of unfolding policy contexts, a role that Deleuze describes as that of the mediator. And could the concept of policy ecology help us to engineer what Wanda has called for as more relational ways of engaging in policy contexts? Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, can you hear me? Is this all right? Uh, just like Sam, I'd like to thank uh, Wanda for that lovely paper. I'd also like to thank Sam for your 
contribution and also Amy and Carol for this opportunity to talk here today. Um, thinking about how to respond to Wanda's paper, um, I considered four things. First, I wanted to call attention to some of the contested discourses of scientificity at play in and around the discussion of education policy research. Secondly, I wanted to call attention to the social practices at work here today in this space, the spectacle of the lecture, if you like. Thirdly, I wanted to find a way to enact rather than describe or defend a transgressive or destabilizing post-structural research practice. And fourthly, I needed to do this within the 20 minute time limit that the organizers had gave, given me. And this uh, fourth task proved the most difficult by far. Anyway, so I decided to present to you an ethnographic play. An ethnographic play is a form of research writing which follows the ethnographic tradition of generating data, or creata, as I like to call it, through observations of and conversations with uh, the particular natives in question. And my natives for the past 15 years have been academics in the social sciences. Presenting research findings uh, through a play is a strategy that, to put it very briefly, underscores the performative work of knowledge creation and knowledge sharing, and the role of both the author and the reader or audience. Drawing on the genre means, uh, drawing on the genre of play means deliberately invoking a literary tradition which has other ambitions than to provide absolute truth or any other form of certainty. The play, as you can see, is called This is Wissenschaft or This is not Wissenschaft. And Wissenschaft means science in German. And it is in three acts. It is written for performance, but as we could not engage actors here today, I decided to read the play for you. The play involves a cast of 12 speaking parts. We have a keynote speaker called Dr. Karen Smith, a moderator, an audience member, and nine different conference delegates. There's also a large number of extras involved, about 250 conference delegates. Um, each act will be supported by a slide that shows the order of speakers so that you can, so you can know who is talking and imagine me changing shape accordingly. Uh, I am not an actor, so I can't do voice changes and things like that. So, you know, you need to help me there and imagine things. Um, I will also need, need to read some of the instructions for the director that set the scenes and stipulate the, the nonverbal. I haven't tried this before, so hopefully it will work. So we start with the instructions. We are in a large university lecture hall. There are banners at each side of the elevated lectern at the front of the room that display the title of a social sciences conference. The title is modern, but not audacious. People are sitting in rows upon rows facing the lectern. The room is relatively quiet apart from the voices that come from the person standing at the lectern speaking into the microphone. Dr. Smith. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that collective biography as a post-structural research practice is a wonderful way of gaining access to the stories people live by within and against education policies and in doing so creating knowledge of the ways in which subjectivities come to be and come to matter in contemporary society. There's a slight pause. She looks up from the paper and says, thank you very much for your time. Now the instructions. The audience clap, some enthusiastically, some less so. There are even a few not clapping at all, but who instead raise eyebrows and send knowing gl glances to people usually seated fairly close by. A man who before was seated in the front row rushes up to the lectern and speaks into the microphone, the moderator. Thank you very much for this interesting talk, Dr. Smith. You certainly have given us a lot to think about today. He smiles at Dr. Smith, who sips a drink from a fashionable BPA-free bottle and smiles back. <laughs> I can see we have a few minutes left for questions or comments. And please, keep these short, ladies and gentlemen. 
He surveys the crowd. There's a slightly awkward moment. But then someone raises his hand. Yes, sir. You please. And please do speak up. The audience member. Thank you. Um, I'd like to... <clears throat> well, that certainly was interesting. I was wondering, Dr. Smith, if you'd like to comment. Um, I might not have penetrated all the jargon that you so enthusiastically presented to us, but from where I'm sitting, it sounded as if you were saying that it is perfectly all right for us in the social sciences to conduct these feel-good focus groups with our friends and then go and write up the stories and then call them scientific knowledge. Um, I must admit I was slightly alarmed by this, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here. So he sends telling glances around and even winks at one person at another row. How on earth can we expect to be taken seriously by our communities and, importantly, policymakers when we do things like this? I mean, what happened to rigor, to reliability, to detachment, not to mention objectivity? Are you saying that taxpayers and policymakers should be happy to spend millions of dollars on some new initiative based on this, based on this um, I struggle to name it, this kind of um, art therapy? A few voices from the audience call out, here, here. Other audience members shake their heads. There's a rustle of voices, but they quiet down, or most of them do, as Dr. Smith steps up to the microphone. One hand clutches the lecture very tightly. Thank you for your comment. Um, question. She clears her throat. Well, first of all, I think some of the jargon you refer to answers your question, but let me see if I can put it differently. She clears her throat again. I am not arguing for research methodology that fits your criteria for quality and relevance. I'm arguing for one that contests them, disputes them. As such, I'm arguing for other notions of rigor and validity. Communities and policymakers, if you like, have come to expect scientific knowledge to look a certain way, your way. However, this is an upshot of history rather than anything else. Most policymakers I know already know that policymaking is a political act, and science, as Latour reminded us, is politics by other means. Politicians will make policies based on prior ideological commitments, despite claims to evidence-based policymaking. If we were to remind everybody of that and then rethink our relationship to publics and politics from a reductive and naive what works stance to one committed to engaging desires and bodies, then things could be quite different. I hope this goes some way to answer your question. She steps back from the microphone and looks at the moderator who rushes to the front. Uh, thank you, moderator. Thank you very much for keeping that short and sweet. Um, controversial as usual. Um, we've now run out of time, but I'm sure Dr. Smith would be happy to talk to anyone during morning tea, which is ready for us outside. Now the audience starts talk, start talking and start getting out of their chairs. The moderator tries to insert. But before we go, let's put our hands together for Dr. Smith once more, and he claps enthusiastically. There is scattered clapping, but most people are gathering their things and heading for the door. There are a few people who stand up and clap fervently, smiling at Dr. Smith all the while. Curtains. The instructions are, we are in a large room at the conference venue. Tables with white tablecloths are placed against the walls, and on them are large thermos with tea and coffee stacks of white cups with saucers and plates with cheap biscuits. People stand in groups, balancing their cups and chatting. The lights turn to one group. Oh, wasn't that wonderful? Isn't she great? Yeah, I really like her work. I usually adore her, but I'm not sure she answered that awful question very well. It was all a bit abrupt and that's exactly what I thought. I'm not sure she did herself or our work any favors there. She can't afford to be so angry and so dismissive. Yeah, but it's hard, you know, don't you think? We should give her a break. Rumor has it that her application for, mo for promotion just got knocked back, so. Lights turn to the next group. Can you follow the conversation? Yeah. Ew, this is terrible coffee. So what did you guys think? 
Interesting enough, I guess. I can see the appeal of this. Some of my graduate students, the weaker ones, I guess, would love it. It's still a bit too touchy-feely, isn't it? I agree about the appeal, but I wouldn't advise my own students to touch it. It's just too risky. Sure, and the question that was raised did point to some of the problems, I thought, and sorry guys, that's Professor Johnson over there. I need to go and smooch him. He's just become editor of a book series I want to publish with. Let's turn to the third group. Oh my God. <laughs> I couldn't have stomached another minute of that dribble. Let me say it before you do. Das ist nicht Wissenschaft. <laughs> yes, exactly, and how opposite to put it in German. <laughs> All I was thinking was, what were the conference organizers thinking? So many of us here are doing serious work, and then they reserve a keynote address for this? I just can't believe it. Yes, standards are slipping. It's a worry. It's typical of them, these postmodernists, to not answer a straight question with a straight answer. She just gave her even more of that mumbo jumbo. And who is this Latour fellow anyway? It's appalling, isn't it? I'm glad to say that it's on its way out in my department. It was always just going to be a passing fad. Science will prevail. That's what I keep telling people. We need good old common sense back setting the agenda. Real social science for the real world, solving real problems. Curtains closed. The instructions are, we're in a standard hotel room. It's drab, 129 bucks a night, probably no more. There's a large bed in the middle. At the end of it sits Dr. Smith, or Karen as we'll now call her sticking out one leg, slowly wiggling her foot up and down. Karen speaking to herself. Swollen legs and a splitting headache? Great! She gets up, gingerly, and walks to a mirror where she stops to look at herself. A finger traces across the forehead and then it starts rubbing off some smeared mascara. I hate those depressingly predictable questions from the floor. I can spot them a mile away like what about science, little miss? It's infuriating, so freaking patronizing. The rigor mortis brigade out to discipline the naughty girl. The rubbing becomes quite vigorous for a second before she stops. She smooths her hair and walks to the window looking out at the gray skyline. It's pathetic how we, to, how we have to pretend to engage with each other. It's a charade and nothing good ever comes from these exchanges. And I just couldn't do it today. Be nice, smile, be gracious, and even a little apologetic. I know I got too pitched, too aggressive. She turns away from the window and sits down on a chair at a small table where there's a laptop computer open. She clicks the mouse a few times, appears to be reading something, sighs. We regret to inform you, yada, 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 performance on the external grants, KPI is less than satisfactory, yada, 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 yada. Industry links, yada, 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 research impact, yada, 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 engage policymakers in your field. She closes the laptop, gets up, irritated, walks back to the window, looks out with a mix of irritation and despair. To them, I am nothing without research industry funding, without meeting their constructs of impact, being of use, usefulness, utility. All that with a smile, with a positive can-do attitude, with the appropriate concern frowns of the grown-up. She shrugs. She sits back down at the end of the bed and resumes wiggling her feet. But what I ask you, what is the price of getting to that treasured, alluring policy table, to the big pot of money, to the pacts on the back, to the funded research centre, to the titles and accolades, to the space where you, your work, is taken seriously, where you can form allies, be friends, make connections. And what moral panic machine do you, have, do you want me to plug your and my desires into? Because we need one of those, don't we? To get you to open your pockets and adorn your listening ears. So we'll happily reproduce them for you so that we can be of use. And a moral panic machine needs a scientific apparatus still. 
with its reassurances, its guarantees and promises. We will be edgy enough to make you feel that you're helping us push the envelope, even perhaps make you feel alive or a little bit reckless. We'll be responsible enough, though, to make you feel safe. We'll help you act on a good cause, stroke the Good Samaritan in you, without ever making <clears throat> it cost too much or shake the construct that is keeping the problem in place. Cynical, perhaps, maybe. And with a sigh, she lets herself fall back on the bed, throwing her arms up above her head. And curtains close. Thank you. Thank you.